Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the new edition of Breakfast Seminars. Today we have Eric, who's, be, who's, go, who's going to be talking to us about the relevance of public transport in self-driving future. Um, Eric will speak for about 30 to 35 minutes, after which we will open the floor up for discussion. Um, if you wish to watch our upcoming seminars, please sign up on our website and you will find our previous seminar also on our website. So now, without further ado, Eric, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Let me start this, the, this, the video as well. Um, okay, so hello everyone. My name is Eric Amla. I'm a PhD student here at the ATH and in Transport Re the Integrated Transport Research Lab at KTH. I made this study together with Mikael Nybakka, Anna Pernestol, and Eric Nelius. Um, and I will be talking today about will public transport be relevant in a self-driving future? And I know that this like new for th this format is a bit new to both, I think, for me and for you as well. And uh, we we're going to do this in a bit of a special way. So. Um, in order for you to be able to engage a bit, I will take a lot of breaks during the presentation and you'll be able to ask questions either by using the Q&A, which you can see in the Zoom app, or by like raising your hand and we will uh, well, uh, make it able for you to speak. Um, I will be talking for, um, I think, a total amount of about like 50 minutes, but that includes your questions as well. So uh, before I start, I'm just going to go through what I will be talking about. So the first thing is like aim, aims and assumptions for, for this study. Uh, I will give some brief information about Stockholm for those of you who aren't from Stockholm. Uh, I will also uh, spend quite a lot of time uh, discussing the, uh, different sem the different scenarios that we have uh, investigated in this study in order for you to actually understand what the results mean. Then I will spend uh, some brief, in, brief time also on explaining the transport model that we've been using in this, this, um, uh, this uh, study. Uh, this is not, however, like a method-based uh, uh, seminar. It's more about the results, so it's going to be quite brief. Uh, then I will be talking about the results in this study, uh, divided into three different sections. And then I will finish by the conclusions that we have from this study. So without any further ado, we're going to jump straight into the aim and assumptions. And in addition to working at ITRL, I also work as a traffic analyst for the Stockholm Public Transport Authority, also known as ESSEL. And my main work there is about making forecasts for the future, the future demand for travel. Um, and in that line of work, we're kind of interested, okay, what, what would the future look like for Stockholm? Uh, and then this like new technology with self-driving, uh, self-driving and autonomous technology showed up and we were like, okay, how will this affect the transport system? Uh, and that's kind of what we're interested in. Uh, so that's where, what we're going to look at in the study, like what will this actually mean? But we're kind of taking like a bird eyes view of Stockholm. So I'm not going to talk about how, what, how it will affect things on the street level. It's more like, okay, how will tr transportation within Stockholm change? Will we drive more kilometers with cars than before? How will walking and bicycling be affected? But I'll focus a bit on public transport in this study. But I, I will be talking about all, all the modes. Uh, in this study, we're assuming what I would like to call like a mature technology. So we're not looking at a transition where we have both manually driven cars and autonomous cars. It's just like all cars have some sort of like self-driving technology. Uh, and that includes public transport, so buses, and also uh, cars. And we're also assuming that we have some, some um, that, that we have an acceptance for this by the users as well in this study. So people are comfortable using this, people are comfortable putting their children into self-driving cars as well, for example. So that's kind of the like main assumption for this study. 
And as I said before, we're going to do this in sort of an interactive way, at least. So now if you have any questions regarding aim or assumptions, um, yeah, please go ahead. Shola, do we have any questions in the Q&A, for example? No questions yet, Eric. Okay. Sorry, yeah, we do, we do have one hand up. Um, Felix, you can ask your question. Felix, you can, you're live, you can talk. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Good. Hey. Hi, everybody. I'm Felix from Paris, Felix Cavet. I'm working at uh, Vodacom, and uh, my PhD thesis is almost in the same subject. Uh, oh. I would like to ask about um, what are the cost assumptions you've made uh, to work on this subject? Sorry, the, uh, I didn't hear Cost, you. the cost, financial cost of the technology. Uh, I will get into that uh, a bit later. Okay, uh, okay, okay, sorry. So, so, Thanks. so, so <laughs> yeah, but absolutely, it's a great question. Uh, I will get into that a bit later. Do you have any other questions, Shola? No, thank you very much. Okay, thanks. No, that's it. We can uh, continue. Yeah, absolutely. If you have any further questions, just type them in the Q&A and I will get back to you in a minute. Uh, I will just now uh, briefly talk a bit about Stockholm. So for you, those of you who are from Stockholm, I think this is a good uh, time to get, go get some coffee. Uh, you have about like two minutes, I think. And we'll be quite brief. So um, for the, St the Stockholm region, which is the case study that we've done this, is for Stockholm County. Stockholm County has approximately 2 million inhabitants, uh, spread out over a quite a, I would say, a, a quite a varied geography as well. So I will be showing you like this. So this is like the inner city, uh, it's around here. Uh, it's quite dense. Um, in Stockholm, uh, uh, whereas we have these more like rural parts out here and even way up north as well. Uh, so it's quite a varied uh, area as well. Um, <clears throat> this central part is densely populated, this is more sparsely, uh, and Stockholm, the inner city is built on a few islands. So we have a few like links connecting the south to north uh, areas via either uh, tunnels or bridges. And this is really like, I would say, the bottleneck for the tra transport system within Stockholm. It's just this like north-south uh, link, so, so to say, which might be a bit good to know here. Um, it's approximately one third uh, of all travel uh, on a normal day is like one third is car, one third is public transport, and one third is walking. Uh, walking is, of course, a bit shorter, but in number of trips, this is a bit and some bicycling as well, but it's quite, it, it, it's not that much. Um, so this was just a really brief overview of Stockholm County. Do we have any questions on that before I start jumping into the different scenarios, Shola? Yes, one uh, question from Mats. Go ahead, Mats. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, you say number of trips, why do you select number of trips and instead of uh, personal kilometers or something else? Uh, I will actually mention uh, personal kilometers later. Uh, this is just to give a brief like overview. And I think that the main takeaway is from this is that public transport is approximately the same size as car dependency, which is quite uncommon on the international scale. Uh, this is usually quite a lot more uh, car dependency, not on an Euro European scale, but on an international scale. All right, thank you. Yep. Okay, that's all for now. Okay, uh, then I'm gonna be talking about the different uh, scenarios that we've been using in this study. And I will qu spend quite some time here. And I really hope that you that uh, this will come across uh, neatly as well. Um, so first of all, it's like different possibilities that's really opened up by self-driving technology. and. This was what we started with in this, this uh, study. You really like try to understand like, okay, what could this mean for, for normal people? Uh, and the first thing that I think is really like the big, uh, the biggest game changer about self-serving technology is the fact that 
anyone can use a car. So we really open up for new user groups. So children, for example, who today can't ride a car by themselves, uh, this, like, there's a potential for them to use these, uh, this technology to really get around and be able to move quite a lot more. Uh, within Stockholm, we have a lot of people who don't have a driver's license or don't have a car as well. Um, so what could this mean for, for this county? Um, the other thing is that we have a somewhat like an increased capacity as well, uh, or at least the potential for it in if cars can talk to each other. So uh, we might see like a smaller gap in between each car, uh, thanks to the, to the fact that they might be able to be connected to each other. So when the first car breaks, the second one can break simultaneously as well. So we might see an increased capacity uh, on, on the road network. Might. Not, I'm not saying that it will be like that, but it's a potential. And the third one is car sharing. So a car picking me up, driving me to my destination, then going by itself to another customer uh, and picking her up and driving her to her destination. And this like rerouting is definitely a possibility with self-driving technology. Um, however, we kind of early saw that there's actually a lot of possibilities for public transport to really, really enhance its service uh, using self-driving technology as well. And the first thing that you should know is that of the cost of operating a bus, the bus driver is approximately 50% of the cost. So uh, of course there's some cost connected to purchasing a bus and so on, but if you look at like lifetime, um, the lifetime budget, about approximately 50% of that is the bus. When it comes to the rail system, it's quite different because the major cost factor when it comes to rail transport is the infrastructure. So actually building the railway and maintaining the uh, railway is quite expensive. Uh, that's why we usually tend to draw, to tend to operate on like maximum capacity at, at peak hours. However, at non-peak hours, we're actually running quite a low, uh, on, depending on, on the capacity. So we might have like 25% of the actual capacity that we're running in non-peak hours. And if we would like to increase service during non-peak hours, well, the train personnel is approximately 50% of the cost there as well on off-peak, on-peak on -peak traffic actually to increase all the number of rail. Uh, rail uh, so there's actually some sort of like potential for rail traffic as well to enhance uh, service uh, with a significantly lower cost of today. Um, and then the third one that we've seen in uh, demos all around, the, all around the world, in Sweden I think it exists in, in Stockholm, in Barkaby, in Linköping and in Gothenburg as well. Uh, and these are the like small personalized on-demand shuttles act as a first or last mile solution. So driving you from your home to the railway station, where you actually board the train, which is more like a high capacity uh, high speed, uh, alternative or a, or a BOT solution. So a rapid bus uh, connection, for example. So this like uh, first or last mile solution. So in this study, uh, we're actually looking at two different cases for the car and two different cases for public transport as well. When it comes to car, we're looking at a private self-driving car and a taxi service in the study. Um, the possibilities with this like private self-driving car, how it will affect the transport system might be an increased road capacity, which is the same for the taxi service. Anyone can use a private self-driving car within the household. Whereas anyone can use this and everyone actually has access to a car. What this would mean, however, is that fixed costs. So today you're actually purchasing a car for quite a lot of money and then it's fairly uh, cheap to actually use. Uh, the big, big cost of lifetime cost is, uh, is actually purchasing. Uh, so what we are actually looking at here is like two different cost structures. Either you pay as you go, or you pay a big chunk when you actually invest in it. So in this study, we're not assuming that, um, I mean, assuming that this is like sort of a, like a mature 
technology, we're looking at a um, uh, that this hasn't have had like a significant uh, change in the cost for the car itself. Uh, so for the private self-driving car alternative, we're looking at about 20 cents per kilometer, which is what it costs today to run a car. And the, the other case, we're looking at more like 50 cents per kilometer. So it's a change in cost structure. Uh, and the second one is more related to like lifetime costs of cars. And for public transport, we're looking at two different cases as well. The first one is a service that works mainly as today, a scheduled public transport. Uh, it's still running on a bus schedule and you need to catch the bus on a specific time, otherwise you need to wait for the next one. And the other one is an on-demand public transport. And in the first one, we're looking at a doubled number of trips of peak, connecting a bit to what I was saying before of, of the 50% uh, cost decrease. So with, with the same amount of money, we could have um, increased uh, operations by quite a lot. And a double number of trips on the peak for bus lines, but not for a rail service. And for the second case, we're having it the same as above, but we we'll try to remove all the minor bus lines, so like um, suburban or rural bus lines, and replace them with this like on-demand service connecting you to the nearest train station or the nearest like high-capacity bus. So combining these two cases for car and two cases for uh, transport, we have a total four different scenarios that we're looking at. And the first one is a scheduled public transport and a private car and everything's self-driving here. So it's a scheduled uh, self-driving scheduled public transport and a private self-driving car. The second case is this like on-demand public transport and the self-driving private car as well. The third one is then scheduled public transport and a tax service. And the fourth one is on demand uh, taxi service. So these are the four different scenarios that we're using in this study. I'm also gonna, gonna compare this to reference scenario, which is basically like today, what it looks like today. And you're gonna be seeing this uh, when I speak further of the results as this little thingy up to your right. And depending on which scenario I'm talking about, I'm gonna highlight, for example, so I hope that it's going to be clear what I'm actually talking about. Uh, so these are the four, four different scenarios and the reference scenario in this study. Now, do we have any questions regarding this, Shola? Mm, one question from uh, Jonas. Go ahead, Jonas. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> hey, Eric. Um, where, where, when you list this uh, sort of double uh, double number of uh, travelers and so on, is that based on uh, on some estimate from some model, or is it uh, just a way to, to sort of distinguish scenarios from each other? What do you mean, double number of? Uh, I mean, you said in the in the last slide, you said twice the. It's the number of trips. So yeah. the, the it's the twice the number of, of buses, not the number of uh, travelers. Ah, yeah, okay. So that, that, that's the the info. So, 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 so a bus service that's today maybe running for uh, one bus every thirty minutes is instead running uh, one bus every fifteen minutes. Instead. Okay, I see. I see. Okay, but, but I, maybe I should use another word than trips. Uh, sorry about that. I'm a bit like accustomed to to uh, public transport language, uh, but it's number of uh, of buses, not number of people. Sorry about that. Okay, so uh, we have a question in the Q&A from uh, Francisca, uh, which is, did you also look at the climate impact, greenhouse gas emissions increase and re slash reduction? Uh, yes, we will come to that. Uh, yeah, in a sense, uh, um, uh, we're, we haven't calculated actual um, greenhouse gas emissions, but we uh, calculated the increase in kilometers driven, for example. So it's pretty easy to to extract that into uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Great, and we had one more question in the uh, in the audience, but it's disappeared. So I'm assuming it's about 
reply. Oh, no, it's back again. Peter. <laughs> yes, you're live. So uh, my question was, it seems plausible to me that all scenarios would exist in parallel to some degree. Have you done any mixing of all four scenarios? I think oh, that, uh, I mean, that's definitely a relevant question. Uh, and I think that this, I mean, in the beginning when we discussed this study, it's like, okay, we want the answer for the future. Uh, and I think that's not really reasonable to do. Uh, but as you say, it's probably not going to be one of these like four different uh, corners. It's more going to be like somewhere in between. And I think that the aim of this study is more to give the range than to say like, yeah, it's gonna be like this. So we're more like thinking, okay, is it within this range or within this range in change of kilometers? More like, where are the arrows pointing? Are we seeing an increase in public transport ridership or a decrease, for example? I see, so, so by exploring the extremes, we're sort of setting the boundaries um, for which the future will lie within. We yes. know that it should be somewhere within these boundaries. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Uh, and I think that you should also be a bit hesitant to take the numbers at themselves. Like, yeah, we see an increase in 10%. I think it's more like, is it 10% or 50% increase that we can actually talk about? Uh, hmm. So setting that like, the general direction. Okay. Thanks. Okay, that's it for now, Eric. Okay, great. Um, so I will talk briefly about the transport model as well, uh, just briefly, and then we will dive into results after that. So regarding the transport model, uh, in this study, we have used the national transport model, SAMPERS, uh, which, is, which is maintained by the National Transport Agency in Sweden, Trafikverket. Um, this is a pretty neat model. I mean, it's been used for, for over 20 years in, in Sweden uh, as like the main tool for regional and national planning. It's not, I mean, it's not really accustomed to uh, this like new technology, uh, but the good thing about it is that you can actually see the changes in demand if you change some parameters. So increasing the service on a bus line will yield more, more passengers and maybe as well like uh, fewer people riding a bike on the same stretch or maybe fewer people using the car alternative as well. And we can also see a total increase as well. So it's not just that people change modes between bus and car. It's also that we can see a total increase in transport demand as well, which is a good thing about this model. Um, it's, um, yeah, so Sampras is actually like takes care of all the modes, but public transport has been modeled using VSIM, which is a software from PPP. Um, in this study, we changed a bunch of parameters in order to incorporate these different scenarios, and I won't go into detail on exactly what we changed and how, uh, because I think that's a bit technical, but if you're interested, please reach out to me afterwards, or if you have time during the discussion, maybe we can bring that up. Uh, but what I would like to talk about that we have not changed is two things, and one of them is land use, so we're assuming that we have no change in, in where people live or where people work, of course going to change but we set this parameter to fixed in this study and we haven't made any changes to the road network except increasing the capacity on it. Uh, so there are no new roads so we haven't removed any roads or anything like that. We changed the, the public transport network quite, quite a lot. Uh, but, I mean we haven't built any new roads thanks to this technology for example. So that's like an assumption as well in this study. So that was, all, uh, uh, that was all I intended to say about the transport model. So before I go into the results, do we have any further questions? Uh, Shola? Yes, we have one question from Martin. Go ahead, Martin. Yes, Martin. Sorry, I didn't realize I'm, I was on mute. Um, so Martin here, um, Sweco, I'd like to hear, Eric, your thoughts on the, <clears throat> on the choices of models and 
and what sort of uh, limitations that might have and, and, and also what, what sort of further studies you might want to see on the back of that. I think, I mean, pretty soon after we, we investigated what types of model there was, we saw that, yeah, there's really not any model that's going to be significant in all, I mean, be, be good in all, all ways, uh, in all senses. Uh, the main reason for using this was, first of all, that I had some quite a lot of experience with working with it, uh, which of course helps. Uh, and also just the demand part that you can see really like changes in demand. So a lot of studies have changed, have looked at only car, for example, and see changes in car ridership, but haven't really looked at the other modes and like interplay between each modes. And that's something that we really wanted to capture in this, this study. Uh, I think that for example, Matsim, if you're familiar with that, would have been a good option, but there wasn't really any model for Sweden available uh, that, uh, that we know of, with this, which had like demand coupled to it as well. Uh, but I think that, I mean, I think I, I would definitely would like to have tried other, uh, other models as well, more dynamic ones as well. Right, so um, next we have a question in the Q&A from Jonas, uh, and it's a two-part question. So. How does Trafik Verket validate the model, uh, firstly, and how do, you, how do you validate your modifications? Yeah, so I mean, Trafik Verket validates it according to um, observational data. So, I mean, the model basically have, have like all the, uh, the people living in Stockholm and then all the workplaces and all the like service uh, locations as well. And then you press the button and run the model and then you measure it compared to, to other measured values. So number of actual cars passing through key points in Stockholm, for example, um, or total number of kilometers traveled. So the few data points that we actually have on car travel or public transport where we know quite well how many people actually travel. So that's basically how you validate it. And I mean, it's been calibrated for all well, 20 years this set of model, but 50 years since we started doing this type of uh, research. And in this study, I mean, it's pretty hard to validate against something that doesn't really exist. And I think that's also, I mean, kind of what I wanted to get back to with Petter's question last year as well. Like, okay, we're not really trying to say exactly what this will mean. I think it's more relevant to compare the different scenarios than say that, okay, this scenario produced an increase by 40%. It's more relevant to see that, okay, in one scenario we get minus 40% and this plus 40%. Okay, so it's definitely a, need, uh, a difference between these two. Okay, great. That's everything for now, Eric. Okay, let's dive into the results then. Um, so, first of all, we're going to start with the number of trips. Uh, and this bar chart, okay, so first of all, uh, this little thingy popped up out here now. So, this tells you that at the moment we're looking at the reference scenario because that's how it's actually shown in the graph below here. This data you might recognize from before, it's the same as the pie chart, but in a column chart instead. So we have a uh, number of trips by car, public transport, walking, and bicycling. Okay. Yeah. And if we compare this then to this scheduled public transport or private car, everything self driving again, uh, we see uh, mostly an increase in uh, number of car trips, uh, up to about like 50. And the other modes haven't changed all that much. There's like small decreases in walking and bicycling and a small increase in, uh, in the number of uh, public transport trip as well. And remember that this is like an enhanced public transport and this is also an enhanced like private car as well. So we should expect to see somewhat like increases in both of them. Uh, the second one is this like on-demand public transport and the uh, self-driving private car as well. Um, and in this scenario, we see almost the same uh, graph as before. Um, so, I mean, the only thing that's changed between these two is this like going from scheduled public transport to this on like on-demand solution. We, we see a somewhat of a small increase depending on these two, but I mean, there's not a major difference. Uh, 
uh, it's basically the same results. What's a bit more interesting is actually when we look at this like taxi service, so a service that's P that, that anyone can use, it basically picks you up uh, when you need it, but it costs a bit more per kilometer. Um, we see a fairly large increase in, in uh, number of trips made by car, actually a doubling of the number of trips and a decrease for all other modes by approximately 30%. So quite like drastic decreases. And comparing this to this fourth scenario, the on-demand public transport and taxi service, where we added this like on-demand um, public transport, so uh, something picking you up by the door and driving you to, to this like rail station, for example. Um, we see, well, it's basically the same picture as this, uh, as this previous one. There's a small increase in this public transport number of trips compared to this one, but it's I mean, it's pretty minimal. Uh, we don't really see a huge impact in this in, uh, on, on the results. Um, <clears throat> if we then compare this to another, another measurement, which is the one that I will be mostly talking about today, and that we got a question from earlier as well, is kilometers traveled. So this is like, okay, so the number of kilometers traveled within, with each mode. And this is the reference scenario then. Um, so if you might remember that uh, car, public transport and walking were like basically the same, so one third for each. But as to no one's surprise, uh, walking is uh, that uh, shorter. So in terms of kilometers traveled within Stockholm, it's basically 50-50 between public transport and car today. Uh, yeah. If we then compare it to this uh, first scenario with the schedule of public transport, so enhanced public transport, and these private cars as well, we see a similar pattern as before uh, when we talk about number of trips. So car uh, increases somewhat, about like 15% or something, uh, and public transport is basically the same. I think there's like a small, small decrease here, but it's basically the same. Uh, and some small decreases in walking and bicycling as well. Um, but it's not really a game changer, I would say. We then compare this to this like on-demand public transport and private car. Uh, we see a similar picture. We could see actually see a small increase here for the public transport mode. Uh, so it seems to be somewhat relevant at least to change to this like on-demand solution instead of a scheduled bus line. Uh, <clears throat> but the biggest change is of course when we actually look at the this taxi service, so a service that you that anyone can use. Uh, instead of it uh, that you need a driver's license and you actually need to purchase a car, <clears throat> we see a, quite a big difference. So the number of kilometers ridden by uh, car is pretty uh, unchanged from these two. Uh, there's an, uh, still an increase compared to reference scenario. And we actually see decreases by quite a lot when it comes to number of kilometers traveled by public transport, walking and bicycling. And as you can see the total number doesn't really change all that much from this first one. So the number of kilometers traveled by the average Stockholmer uh, doesn't change all that much in, in this scenario. And if you compare this to this last one, we also see like a small increase in public transport, but it's, I mean, it's pretty marginal. Uh, so, I mean, what does this mean? Because as you might remember, we had a huge increase in number of trips when it comes to this taxi service, but not, in kilometers driven. I mean, somewhat an increase, but it's not proportional at all. Well, it means that trips are become much shorter. So I'm going to show you um, car trip distance in one of these scenarios. So the average uh, or you know, the share of different uh, trips. But we're just going to look at this one. So scheduled public transport and taxi service. And what we can see here so the blue one is the reference scenario, so that's today. Uh, and the red one is this scenario. Mm -hmm. What we can see is that the number of short trips have really increased for the car, whereas we actually see a decrease in these like, really much longer trips, which is probably due to the fact that uh, we have increased the, the, the cost per kilometer quite a lot. So instead of having 20 cents per kilometer for Kronor, 
uh, we see uh, an increase to 50 cents per kilometer or five kilometers in each kilometers. So we actually see a, dis a difference in type of movement that we do within Stockholm, um, comparing these like taxi service to this private self-driving car. Uh, yes, so that was the first like overview of uh, changes and I'm going to go further into geographical differences, but do we have any questions uh, before I do that, Shola? Yes, we have a question from uh, Rolf. Go ahead, Rolf. We're not hearing anything. No. Okay. Let's um, let's go on to um, Felix then. Felix, you. Yeah. You're on. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, just to know what are the value of time assumption you've made for all the uh, mode? Uh, I wasn't able to change that within this study, unfortunately. Uh, okay. It wasn't easily start, uh, changed in this model. So those are the same that the one on yeah. the Cernet? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, unchanged. Okay, cool. Okay, great. Uh, then Martin. Hi there, Eric. So um, we, what we could conclude from your, your slides here is that the, the on-demand public transport service really doesn't uh, make a big difference. So what is, the logic behind, uh, what is the logic behind that result, you reckon? I think it's, uh, it was more that we actually were interested in, does it have an impact? And I think that the answer is mostly no. Uh, and I think that's actually a conclusion as well, uh, that we can see that, yeah, this, this might be a solution, but it's not a game changer to the public transport as a mode, uh, which is, I think is an important conclusion as well. Okay, now we have a question in the, um, we have a question in the chat. Um, let's start with uh, Gyoso. Uh, which is, do the costs of the on-demand public transport change in the scenarios? Um, no, I've kept it fixed. Um, in this, in this, uh, yeah, no, it's fixed. And what you should know is that uh, Stockholm has a fixed cost uh, for the entire county, so you don't pay, uh, there's, it's not a trip, it's not a distance-based or a time-based uh, cost, for example. And in this uh, study, it's not, a, it's not changed from the reference scenario at all. Okay, great. And we have one, uh, one more question in the q and it's, it's a little bit long, but um, I'll give it a go. So if the result is indifferent for scheduled versus on-demand public transport, could we thus conclude that the perceived performance, brackets, quality, is similar? In other words, the scheduled system operates as good as an on-demand system would in Stockholm, or are there parameters which might be interesting to study here? Did you get that? Uh, yeah, and I think that basically my answer is yes. Uh, that I mean, I think it's definitely, I, I will actually get into that a bit more uh, later, but I think that's the right way to conclude that, yeah, it's probably not it's not going to revolutionize public transport. Uh, that's, that's the result from this study, at least. Uh, yeah. Okay, then that is all of the questions for now. Okay, great. Um, let's continue then to geographical differences, because we would actually get back to this um, on-demand public transport system. So this is Stockholm County, or most of it, because it's so freaking huge, so we couldn't really fit it in with, within one image and still keep it somewhat uh, right sized. Um, a nice thing about using a transport model is that we can actually see geographical differences as well. So it's not, it doesn't just like pop out one answer for the entire Stockholm, as you have seen before. You can actually see the results divided into different zones within Stockholm. So the Stockholm is divided into 1,400 different zones. And uh, the zones are somewhat similar in, in uh, the number of inhabitants within uh, each zone. So you might see, it's a bit hard to see now, you'll see later uh, a bit better. 
we see this zone is quite big because not a lot of people live there. But in like the center parts of Stockholm, zones are really small. So they're like somewhat similar in size when it comes to number of inhabitants or number of workplaces, for example. Um, so what we will look at here is the change in kilometers traveled compared to the reference scenario. So as you can see here, we will see the, uh, the reference, reference scenario, but it's like this result compared to the reference scenario. So it's on demand, public transport, and the private car. And these are the results, as you, and you can see down here is the legend. So, I mean, the main takeaway here is that for this scenario, uh, for most zones, we see a fairly small difference. So a change within like uh, minus 10 to plus 10 uh, percent in change in number of kilometers traveled by car. So most zones don't really experience a big increase or decrease. We see a somewhat of an increase in kilometers um, traveled within the central parts. It might be a bit hard depending on your screen size, but uh, it's a bit greenish out there. And then we have a few outliers, which I think we can safely ignore. And then also we see a reduction in number of car kilometers traveled for the more rural parts of Stockholm. And you might remember here that this is actually the scenario where we do have private self-driving cars, but it's the same cost of operating a car as before. So we actually only increase the service level of the car and increase the service level of public transport. And this actually gets back to the, the question that we had before, like, okay, this on-demand public transport didn't really make a big difference. Well, it actually does, because these zones today have a quite poor service. Um, these are actually like a, a few of them are islands, but most of them have some sort of connection to the mainland, but it might be a bus that has a headway of like two hours. So if you miss the bus, you need to wait two hours to get it. And if you change this to this like on-demand solution, well, it seems to be quite attractive in these more like rural parts. Uh, which, I mean, that's fairly intuitive as well. So it might actually have a role to play here. Um, so if you compare this then to this scenario, uh, the on-demand public transport and taxi service. So it's the same solution for public transport and then we change from the private self-driving car to the taxi service. We see a somewhat similar but exaggerated result. So as you can see here, downtown Stockholm, is uh, more like blue greenish or darker, darker greenish. Um, so a lot of zones experience an increase in car kilometers traveled by like 30 to 50%. Uh, whereas these zones, the more rural parts experience quite a, quite a drastic uh, decrease in number of kilometers traveled. Um, which is probably due to the fact that we just got this, as I was talking about earlier, uh, that the number of uh, kilometers traveled uh, with this like long distance uh, trips actually decreased. And I mean, the average trip length here is of course way longer than it is here to get to your destination. So uh, this, this uh, kilometer, in, uh, this increase in cost per kilometer uh, really makes the car alternative much more unattractive here. Um, and this, well, if you, the on-demand public transport, as I said before, is a bit more attractive here now uh, than it was before. So this is like changing car kilometers traveled. Uh, I'm gonna go further into trip purposes, but I'm guessing that we will have a few questions on this subject as well, Shola. So, Felix has another question. He, yes, Felix. Again, can you hear me? Okay, I see you can hear me. Um, I have a question about the congestion. Do you have any congestion issues in Stockholm? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. And, I mean, this doesn't improve that. <laughs> I can, so you can, uh, you can safely that. say that, that, that this doesn't uh, help the congestion levels, that's for sure. Okay, and you have a congestion measure on your model, or uh, model? not that I'm showing, not that I'm showing at the moment. Uh, okay, but uh, reach out to me, and I can definitely uh, send over a few graphs of like uh, medium congestion level or medium uh, uh, 
uh, like uh, average uh, speed per link, for example. Sure, that does it. Okay, great. So now we have another Felix. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, great. Yeah. Felix here, WSP. I was curious, uh, the costs per kilometer that you mentioned for the taxi service and the private car, was that based on current costs or what were the assumptions there? Because it seemed quite important for the results. Yes, it's current costs. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, so the mar I mean, the cost... The marginal cost today of running running a uh, car is about two kroners per kilometer, so 20 cents uh, per kilometer. But if, if you actually incorporate all these fixed costs, especially purchasing a car, it's more like 50 cents. Uh, but it's, yeah, yeah, so that's it. But it's more like lifetime costs. Okay, we'll take... Uh two more quick questions and then uh, continue. So, uh, Anne, next. Anne, you're live. Still nothing? Okay, no, um, nothing there. Um, and, um, sorry, one second. Uh, Claudia would like to ask a question. Um, yes, Eric, I would like to ask you something. So we see that uh, the, in the outer zones, uh, the on-demand has a, a better, uh, like it's more attractive now than the previous scenario. And I, don't, I didn't really understand why is that? I mean, uh, it's basically because if you live, live here in the outskirts of Stockholm, you might have today a bus service that runs one bus every hour or one bus every two hours. So replacing that with this like, yeah, you can actually call when you need a bus and it drives you to the nearest like bigger uh, bus station. I mean, that's really much more attractive than one waiting for two hours or missing the bus or whatever. Yes, uh, sorry, I, I think I didn't phrase my question right. I mean, in this scenario then in the on-demand public transport and private car, uh, I, I understood that it's more attractive in this. Yes. So here it seems less attractive and then in the next one it seems more attractive. Yes, uh, but I mean what we actually changed between these two is only the car service. Uh, and we made the car service a bit less attractive for people living here since the cost per kilometer has gone up so much. So people are um, are taking public transport, transport more and actually decreasing the number of trips uh, traveled as well in total. So they're actually decreasing the number of trips and some have shifted to public transport. Did that answer the question? I, I think so, thank you. Okay, great. Okay, great. Uh, we better move on a little bit to keep up with yeah. the, the schedule. Yes. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna... I'm gonna talk a bit about trip purpose because um, this model divides trip purposes. It's like three different trip purposes that you can have. I'm gonna only gonna discuss two of them at the moment. And one of them is work trips, and the other one is like other trips, so leisure trips, service trips, going to your grandma, for example. Um, and if you start by the reference scenario, that um, so a normal day about eight million kilometers are driven by car uh, so about five of them are for work trips and three are for like other trips and, things. and for public transports it's fairly similar as well and if we then <coughs> try these different scenarios so i'm going to show you uh, this one so this like on demand public transport and private car that we looked at previously um, <coughs> we see somewhat of an increase in uh, car in uh, kilometers traveled for work trips for a car and the somewhat of an increase for public transport work trips and public transport other trips. But the really interesting thing is actually here, where we can see that the number of kilometers uh, ridden by uh, car, the car mode really increases quite a lot. So we, don't, we, uh, we do have an increase in like overall traveled by car, but almost everything is actually for like non-rush hour thing, 
I mean, non rush hour times to start with, and it's more like that you increase your like leisure time. So going going to your friends more, for example. So I mean, that's quite interesting. That almost everything is actually this other trips as well. And if we compare this to this scenario, we see a really similar image. So the number of uh, trips written to work changes somewhat, increases somewhat, and increases quite dramatically for like other modes uh, when it comes to car. And for public transport, we have small decreases. So instead, if we look at everything, we see like a similar image. So, I mean, I think this, this one is the really important one that we actually see that all the increases actually for other trips, so leisure and service trips. So, I'm going to go into findings, but do we have any quick questions regarding this before I can? Nope, seems like this was quite clear. <laughs> no questions. Okay. okay. That's either like a very good sign or a really bad sign. Uh, but I think that we can absolutely, absolutely get back to this because I will just uh, round off with the conclusions. Uh, so, I mean, the main findings for this, uh, first of all, to get a bit back to the main question of this, will public transport be relevant in a self-driving future? And I think that, I mean, it kind of depends, of course, on which scenario we're actually looking at. Uh, but what we could see for, especially for the taxi service, is that public transport really decreased. Um, and especially for the inner parts, the central parts of the county, but it was still a major mode in the central parts. And I think that also uh, the congestion levels that we talked about a bit previously are, aren't really being helped by this. And this model isn't really that good at modeling congestion either, which I think should be taken into account. When we talk about this like on-demand service, and we talked about earlier that, yeah, it doesn't, is it this, it isn't really a game changer. Well, yeah, but it actually had a somewhat of an effect for these more like rural parts. It's not a big increase when we're talking about the like total travel, uh, traveling within Stockholm, but for the rural parts, it's, it's definitely a fair share and something that could be attractive, but maybe, the big ink impact from this, this new technology when it comes to public transport isn't really about ridership. It might be that maybe we shouldn't uh, put all the money into uh, increasing the number of trips by public transport. It's more like, okay, maybe we instead should, uh, should put it into healthcare or whatever. Which seems like a pretty good idea these days. Um, when it comes to especially the taxi service, uh, we see decrease in the rural car traffic, but that might be to the fact that the cost model that we tried here with the increased cost per kilometer might not be an attractive cost model for, for rural parts of Stockholm. I mean, you could imagine that the waiting time for, for this service might be, like, might be quite bad as well. I mean, picking up a car, in downtown Stockholm is probably a wait of like two minutes, but you can easily imagine that it would like be like 30 in more like rural parts of Stockholm where a car isn't always available. And we also see, saw quite a large effect for leisure travel, uh, which is quite more than for the commuting parts, the work trips. Um, and I mean, what could this mean for, for the transport system? Uh, probably that we will have more like even, um, even, uh, or more like that we actually increase car travel within like, uh, within like non-peak hours as well. Uh, and actually use the capacity on the, on the highways a bit more. Uh, but also like a total increase in, in car traffic as well. And I haven't really talked about this, about, about like electrification or if we're still using combustion engines, but I mean, it's not, it, it's not, uh, I mean, it's fairly easy to say that, okay, what could this actually mean for sustainability? And I think that my large, my, my last bullet point really ties into this. And this is that actually we saw a decrease in walking and bicycling in all scenarios. Um, and especially for this access service one. 
uh, and almost for all all geographies of power, I should mention. So I mean, what this what does this mean for for uh, sustainability? Yeah, it's a good question. I think that these are the main findings of the study. Yeah, so do we have any other questions regarding this or previous? Right, so um, now that we're now that we're finished with the um, the presentation, we can open the floor up to um, to have a little bit of a discussion, which means that you can either raise your hand or you can type a question in the Q and A, and we'll we'll take all of them in the the order that they come up. So we have a question first from from Anne, which is taking the perspective of a commercial taxi service provider, they would put more supplier in the central locations where demand is highest aggravating the spatial differences in car kilometer outcomes. On the other hand, they might charge a per trip cleaning fee and transaction fee, which would make short trips somewhat pricier per kilometer. Did you discuss policy response options targeting taxi service providers? Uh, we have not in this study, but I think that's, um, I mean, I think that this study is more like a good starting point to actually discuss policy and that's kind of our intention as well to maybe build on this study to talk about okay what could this actually mean for Stockholm, um, the municipality of Stockholm for example. And I think that also something that we did not have in this cost model was for example like a transaction fee. So I mean getting into a taxi cab today costs about like five euros just to step into the car and then there's a, like a lower cost per kilometer here and here it's more like fixed so each kilometer is equally worth and that's not I mean not really all that realistic um, I think that's uh, we should definitely talk more about policy implications okay great any more any more questions or discussion points from the audience Yes, so uh, let's take Martin next. Obviously, my, my conclusion from this is that you're, you're in some ways confirming the fears that we have that the that, uh, um, increase of, of uh, self-driving vehicles will increase congestion in central parts of the cities. And, and obviously, the next question then is, okay, so what should we do about it? Uh, have, you, uh, have you attempted at, at putting forward some suggestions uh, in that in that regard, or is, does anybody else have a have a view on that? Yeah, I think I mean that's definitely a good question. I think that first of all, we shouldn't like embrace all new technology automatically. Uh, we need to be somewhat, at least, uh, uh, I mean, a bit critical of everything like okay is, is this necessarily a good thing or more like okay how should we use this is probably a better question than what will it do for society so take more of an active part instead of a passive and and and, and by that i interpret that what you mean is that we need to continue providing um bus lanes and other priority measures for public transport vehicles in order to 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 maintain good uh, access in the city centers uh, because congestion as it rises will have to be combated in some way yeah i mean absolutely um, but i think that we should also maybe question a bit the the role of public transport as well because the main role of public transport is like providing something that anyone can use uh, but if we actually have a service which is available for everyone, what's the role of public transport then? Well, maybe it's this more like high capacity mode that, which can serve the central parts much more efficiently per square meter, for example. Uh, but I think that I haven't talked about who actually like owns this car, uh, taxi fleet as well. It might be that we want this to be a public good as well so that the pu public transport authority should actually like own these taxi fleets or should be um, private or maybe we shouldn't like, maybe this like more private ownership will still be the most um, attractive one for people to actually do. Uh, I mean, you don't really see 
uh, carpooling to be a significant part of the transport system, yet even though it theoretically could be a thing. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, great. Um, so one more <clears throat> one more quick question before we uh, finish the main time slot, and then um, everybody who would like to is is free to stay um, and ask more more questions. But um, we'll just do one one more quick question before uh, before our time is up. So um, Eric says, being Dutch, I have to ask a bicycle question. You see a yeah. decrease in cycling in most scenarios. Yep. How do you see this in light of the current increase in bicycle usage in Stockholm? Well, uh, uh, first of all, uh, bicycle use within Sweden, and I think that Stockholm is, might be somewhat of, of, uh, of an exception to this, but not at all that much. I mean, bicycling within, within Sweden has actually decreased, if you look at the last 30 years. Um, and people say, yeah, but there's a lot, lot more people on, on, on the bike lanes in Stockholm. But yeah, sure, but children have, children have stopped riding a bike. Uh, people in, in, I mean, in their uh, 30s and 40s are riding a much, lot more bike, uh, but not the main group for riding a bike, which used to be 12 year olds, and they're not really riding a bike anymore. Uh, so we're not really seeing an increase in, in uh, bike usage all that much within Stockholm either, from what I've seen in the statistics. If you look at practical points, yes, but if you use travel surveys, you don't really see all that much. Great. Do we have any more? Sorry. Okay, so um, yes, thank you so much, Eric, for the presentation. It was really great. And thanks to all of you for being here and uh, for more seminars, the upcoming ones and the previous ones. Don't forget to sign up on our website. And uh, I would really encourage you to stay back. And if you have any more questions, please um, have the discussion with Eric and it's a great platform for all of us to do that. So yeah, that's it. And thank you so much for joining us today. So Eric, you're back up and we're now in the, um, we can call it the mingle session. So um, I'll continue with some of the, some of the questions that are waiting. So <clears throat> um, if that was uh, the correct pronunciation, if not, I'm, sorry uh it says thanks eric for your interesting presentation and your work in the transport field what would you state as interesting as an interesting future topic to take the research to the next step i think that actually what i was trying to say to martin as well on his question is that i think that my my initial question regarding this was more like okay what will self-driving technology mean for the transport system and I think that's actually the wrong way to phrase this question. It's more like, I think that we instead should be focusing a bit on what do we want? What do we as a society, what type of transport system do we want? What type of society do we want? And we, when we actually set that goal, try to work towards that goal and see, see if, um, if self-driving technology can actually help us towards that goal or probably more, more to it, like, okay, in what way would it help us? I think that, for example, uh, I mean, there's definitely great possibilities for, for this self-driving technology when it comes to like accident reductions, for example, uh, might be an excellent solution for that. I would love to have not to actually drive when I'm on the highway uh, for longer trips and just lay back and do something more funner than just watching the road for five hours. Uh, but I think that we should more like, okay, what type of transport system do we want and how can this technology actually help us in that way? Uh, so that's kind of what I want to study going ahead. Great, thank you. 
Um, so just a reminder to people, if you would like to ask a question um, live, you can uh, raise your hand in the participant field um, and um, I'll put your mic on live so that you can ask directly. Um, so um, Patrick asks, um, you briefly mentioned the increase of congestion. Will the output over time decrease the attractiveness and use of self-driven cars because of the congestion issues? And maybe more people over time would choose bicycle instead. Yep. I mean, uh, in this model, there's actually a feedback loop for congestion as well. So that's supposed to be taken care of within this model. Um, with that in mind, I think that, well, I mean, Yes and no. Uh, I think that we have like multiple factors playing for and against each mode. And I think that especially for bicycling, and this is more like a personal reflection, I think that we really neglected bicycle, um, the bicycle as mode uh, for the last 50 years, at least within Stockholm and Sweden, and I think most places internationally as well. Uh, so I think that the infrastructure isn't really appropriate for, for how it should be. And I think that a good way to start working towards a good transport system is on the street level uh, and how we plan, plan our society as a whole. Thank you. Um, okay, one more question from the Q&A before we go over to Martin. So Francisco says, hey, uh, Francisco from Sveco here. Did you consider improvements in average speed of the bus service due to priority um, brackets, uh, better signal priority, segregated lanes, better use of future technology from connected vehicles, etc.? No, not in the study. We did not. Uh, but that, I mean, that could absolutely be, be an idea. Uh, but no. Okay, great. Then um, let's um, go to uh, Martin. Um, yeah, just a, a quick um, going back to one of the initial questions about the choice of tool and so on. One of the one of the aspects of of the tool of choice here is that it doesn't really accommodate um, blocking back congestion in junctions, etc. Congestion is is um, uh, covered in 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 some aspects through the through the. Um, um, the volume delay functions, but but not nearly as 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 it represented as it would be in real life. So, by by just reflecting on that a little bit, most likely the the congestion um, uh, that would follow from the increased amount of self-driving vehicles in the city center, most likely we'd see that that people wouldn't choose that mode of transport simply because it's too congested. Um, and, and that might, in, in a way, offset the negative impact that we see of, of sort of increased vehicles. Is that, is that, do you concur in that or am I? I would say so. I, I think that the results for the inner city is a bit, uh, I mean, it's a bit over, over, what do you say, like overestimated a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, and that's something that I haven't really talked about here, um, we might, I mean, if people are not searching for a parking place, what does that mean? And we know that for the central parts of Stockholm, um, this like search traffic is actually quite a big share um, of all traffic. So I think that we have some factors working like for this uh, for this mode and other factors that are working against it. But I think it's a bit overestimated for, for the inner city, I can say. Yeah. And, and uh, I think you're you're spot on with the parking tr uh, aspect. That's that's very much the the reason why I think uh, um, carpooling in the city centre has been quite difficult. Um, and, and 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 further on, we can probably deduce as well that that cycling is perhaps misrepresented in the model to a certain degree because obviously if if congestion becomes a problem, then people might turn back to cycling, which is traditionally at least uh, not so badly affected by congestion. Yeah, and I mean that kind of ties back to my 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 overall what, what I tried to say earlier. Like, uh, you shouldn't take like each individual result in out of context. It's more like actually comparing two different scenarios is actually more interesting than, than saying, yeah, we got an increase by forty percent. Yeah, I think that's more interesting. Okay, great. Um, so let's um, let's go to Islam now. 
Yes, you're live. Um, hey, Eric. Huh? Um, I have a question when you presented the change in uh, and number of trips on a uh, kilometer traveled between the purpose of the trip and the distance. Yep. And I'm not really sure if this is actually connected. Is that change in trips is actually related to the trip purpose or actually the trip distance? Is yes. the trip distance in the ledger is actually short distances and that's why it's connected to the center and that's why it's increasing or is it actually the trip purpose? Uh, so let me get back to trip distance. Uh, here we go. Uh, so, so you mean that all the shorter trips are more like leisure trips? Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, it could be. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, maybe. Uh, because here I'm trying to see if this is uh, more uh, um, the, it's the distance or the trip purpose, and then if the, if the work if it work, then I would expect more in the peak hour increase of the travel kilometer, but this is, would be more of this type. No, I mean, this is, this is for all day. Uh, so this is everything. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so uh, we have something here in the chat, which I think is a question. Um, so uh, it's from uh, Galaxy S8. <laughs> um, so, oh, cool, cool name. <laughs> so I see no application in future operating on fixed costs. A more likely solution is a link based cost where you pay for the negative cost you impose on others by taking up road space. If this study still thinks public transport in Stockholm Centre is relevant, taking into account more expensive driving would probably be um, probably result in the case for public transport in cities. It's even more relevant than the graph shows. Um, Matthias, it was from. Okay. Um, uh, did you get that? You, well, I think so. If I interpret you, I, I guess that we were talking about like fixed cost and distance based cost for public transport. I think, I mean, there's, there's been a lot of research showing that, yeah, it would be much better with distance based or time based. So, would it get people, more people to ride, ride the subway when it's done peak hours? Uh, and I think that like, yeah, everyone within the transport field actually uh, says that, yeah, this should be a good idea, but there's simply no, at the moment, no, um, uh, no public support for it or policy support for it. Um, so I, well, yeah, that would be good, but there's no support for it as of now, at least. I, I hope that answers the question. Um, I'm actually going to look at um, I hope I answered the question. Uh, it was a bit hard to understand. Okay, um, shall we uh, go over to Felix and then um, Patrick after that? Um, Felix? <coughs> Hi again. Hi. Um, I have two questions. The first one is about the differences between scheduled uh, public transport and taxi service. Uh, when you're doing on-demand public transport and taxi services, yep. the differences are the cost and the capacity. Okay. Uh, 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 we'll, uh, yeah. So uh, I mean, let me get back to to explain and different the different when it comes to the car, the different car modes. Uh, These are the two different car cases. So for the private one, it's increased road capacity and it's the same for taxi service. And anyone can use this within the household and anyone can use this taxi service. Well, anyone can use it instead. And then there's a change in, in cost structure instead. And so the differences between undermine uh, CPT services uh, and taxi services are begin to be very close because on-demand CPT services are going to be like huge taxes, but cheaper? Um, almost. It actually connects you to, to the nearest uh, bigger station. So it's not, okay. it doesn't drive you all the way to your destination. It's more like from your home to a high capacity bus line. And then you take the high capacity bus line to the city center and well, 
Okay, so that's kind of uh, based, uh, stop based uh, services? I mean, it's more like artery lines, so uh, suburban, for example. Uh, but but okay. still use a tradition, I mean, the, all the metro lines are still there. Okay. We're still using them. And do you have uh, any measures of the occupation rate of uh, the on-demand uh, public transport? Maybe we, uh, we could talk about that later, but I don't know if the model is able to measure that uh, capacity. Um, maybe. I'll have to think about how to actually extract that. But uh, I mean, theoretically, yes, but it might be a lot of manual labor. Uh, okay. But uh, reach out to me and we can, we can discuss it further. Uh, sure. Absolutely. So, thank you, Felix. Uh, Patrick, um, you... Oh, sorry. Yes, you're live. No sound. Um, sorry. Um, sorry, it's not allowing me to... No. Oh. 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 You hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, could it be useful to take like electrical kick bikes in count for trips inside the city center? Uh, and could that decrease the leisure trips with self-driven cars for the lowest kilometers driven? You haven't taken that in account for this model. No, I mean, no, not really. I, I, I mean, these more like e-bikes or scooters or whatever you call them. And I mean, they're a really new ph phenomenon. So, I mean, uh, no, they're not, <laughs> they're not doing within the model in any practical way at all. Uh, but it could but, have an impact on it. Yeah, maybe. Uh, but we haven't looked at it in this study. I think that's definitely something interesting, but we, well, we couldn't think to it in this study. Okay, well, that looks like um, that's all the questions for today. So thank you, everybody that, um, that stayed behind. And um, you, can, um, you can find Eric's email um, at itrl.kth.se or at the bottom of the, of the current screen, if you can take it down now. And um, yeah, do you have anything else to say, Eric, before we finish off for the day? Uh, no, just uh, thank you for everyone watching. And I mean, please reach out to me if you, if you want any more information or want to discuss this. I mean, just to, not me, not just me saying, <laughs> saying I, I want some feedback as well. Uh, if you're doing any, do you know any other research that might be relevant for me? Hmm? Yeah, that's it. Nice. Great. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Bye now.